You know Lombard Street in San Francisco, the crookedest street in the world. Exactly one century later, a city 90 miles away are building one of their own. Kind of. And it didn't quite turn out the way they thought. Some new road lines are confusing drivers. Take a look at this. These crooked lines, they are real. I've heard of drivers getting DUIs, but I've never seen a street get one. This is the kind of fiasco I have to go see for myself. I don't work for the city. Bro, what is Because he bought on the job, right? <laughs> it must be the orange vest. I don't work for the city. I didn't know we, we were going to drift right now. Yeah, like I, he swerved. I didn't know this swerved. was a legal drift track. <laughs> Locals lining up. I don't work for the city. Oh, how's it going? To share their thoughts. I don't work for the city. <laughs> People definitely have an opinion about this. Yeah. This is why you just don't tell city employees to just have fun with it. No, it's Here's not. the story of one city's nationally recognized mistake that might not entirely be a mistake. In fact, the mistake might have happened 25 years ago. One morning, the mayor wakes up to find a mess in his own backyard. Several cities were interested in what happened here, and some even called and said, Wow, okay, we see what you're kind of doing. Interesting. And I'm like, no, this is not what we're trying to do. This is wrong. <laughs> Ignacio Velasquez tells me that over the summer, the city paid a contractor to chip seal this street, plug up all the holes so water can't get in and ruin the asphalt. But instead of having the contractor restripe the lines the way they used to be, the city wants to try something new. And the contractor eh, got a little carried away. For instance, look at this bicycle lane here. That can't be right. Somebody misread the plans. It got striped wrong, and they have to fix it. He says these zigzagging lines are not really a problem. The mistake is there's too many. These are a little too sharp. You'll see cars that just will keep driving straight through it. Should we take a look at your plans? Sure. He shows me what the city actually wants. You can so, see the delineators right there. The original four lanes go away, replaced by just two, with gentle curves, round islands, and these flappy barriers separating the bicyclists from the cars. Smoother flow, smoother curvature to it. A design a little more thought out than what the city ended up with. So the $100,000 question, why zigzag the lines at all? Well, the city has a speeding problem. A quarter mile stretch like this one, wide open, people going 60 or 70 miles an hour. Only difference is, Lag Lane had two lanes in each direction instead of just one. Nobody wants to go slow in neighborhood streets. And they get to these streets, they want to go really fast. And not street racers. The mayor tells me these are normal people using the medium-sized neighborhood streets like a freeway. These are not racetracks, these are neighborhoods kid crossing the street over here, somebody coming full speed and hitting that child is not a good thing. Well, there's your problem. The speed limit on it's pretty high. Unfortunately, just lowering the speed limit doesn't really do anything. Only a few drivers notice and obey it. Everyone else carries along like nothing changed. That's the nature of human psychology. We don't drive the speed a sign tells us to. We drive the speed that feels comfortable for the road and then the sign reinforces that. That's probably why most places have rules that say speed limits have to reflect a typical speed the average driver would drive. It was getting to the point of having to raise the speed limit higher, which would have made it even worse. If we want to succeed slowing people down, we have to understand why they were going so fast in the first place. Think about the quickest thing to hit the pavement. Not that. What sort of road do you build? For a vehicle that routinely hits a ground speed of 175. Something wide, something flat, something straight. We build a runway. We also build runways so drivers can fly from point A to point B in their car. The arteries of our highway system. Freeways, highways, and even big boulevards. That way we can cover a long distance in a short amount of time. But what do we do with high-speed traffic once we hit the city limit? One option is to make these long-distance drivers slow their car down at the city limit. Bad for drivers, but good for the town. Option two is to send the highway around the town, but that costs a lot of money. Leaving option three, and this is the popular one, 
plowing straight through town. If a city's going to commit to having this high-speed traffic run through the middle of it, other streets need to change to work with it. The city swaps out its grid, where every street is treated the same, and creates a hierarchy, like a circulatory system, like, like a heart, with big, fast arteries that move a lot of volume to serve small, quiet capillaries. But there's a medium-sized street that connects arteries and capillaries together. Streets, like old Zigzaggy here. Lad Lane is a little too important to be a small capillary. Yeah, it's a collector to get you to the main highway. But it's not exactly a big artery street either. And sometimes these collectors get too big. We recognize the problem, not only on this street, but many others. Like Hollister's West Side Boulevard, another medium-sized neighborhood collector street that people are just flying down. Not a runway. When the goal is to keep cars moving, it's a lot harder for somebody walking down the street to cross the street. These medium-sized roads start to look an awful lot like arterials, and they get really wide. I think it's pretty eye-opening to look at Lad Lane here and compare it with a freeway. This specially designed road for going 65 miles per hour isn't really different enough from our medium-sized collector. All of this was the problem the city of Hollister was trying to address when everything went all zigzaggy. What do you do with a really wide road that's only three quarters of a mile long and maybe not as important as we think it is? From the stoplight down there to the entry to the neighborhood is 2,500 feet. And to slow down from 45 to 25 adds 27 seconds. So the speed doesn't even benefit drivers much. There's a mountain to the south, so you know the street is never going through. No major shopping, and there's even a school. Not very much traffic, so there's no need to have four lanes. We have the main highway a few blocks down. Very few people now should be really even using this road. Decades ago when these subdivisions went in, the engineers overlooked this because a new subdivision is the city's one chance to make the developer widen it at the developer's expense. I think they're envisioning this street continuing and building hundreds if not thousands of homes over there. The last thing you want is the developer to finish up the project and walk away and then years later find out, oh no, we got to bulldoze some houses to make room for a wide street that we need. So that's why every new subdivision has a big street widening in the front. And as cities grow out, some of these streets do become very busy and filled with cars and a handful of terrified bicyclists. But other streets never get quite as busy as planners and engineers were afraid they would. Problem is, later comes and you find, oh, only needed two lanes. Now you're stuck with too many of these, well, highways that are scary to cross on foot, expensive to repave, and there really aren't that many people driving on them anyway. So what do we do? Well, the best would be to only make the road as big as it needs to be in the first place. If you're gonna build a new development, you have to be part of the solution to get you to downtown in a safe manner. New rules would make new collector roads have a new look. You'd have the two lanes, you'd have protected bike lanes. But what about our street that's already been built? Well, that's the second best choice. Tear the road down and build it back the right size. But there's a lot of expensive little details like the storm drains. They're now all in the wrong place. And that means moving millions of dollars worth of pipes. Cities usually don't have that kind of cash. That's why they were making the developer widen the street in the first place. That leaves option three, retrofitting the existing road. I've been pushing for it for quite a while. I don't think uh, many people really understood my, my thinking at the time. And the conversation started with, how do we create protected bike lanes? Hollister is not that big of a town. Just 40,000 people, and most of the fast through drivers are on the highways on the edge of the city. So instead of prioritizing moving cars fast through the middle of town, they could focus on helping people walking or bicycling get where they want to go in a shorter distance and more safely. And that meant stepping back and fixing existing streets. Starting with low cost ways to slow drivers down on smaller neighborhood streets. To try to make it affordable first off and safe at the same time. Engineers and planners have a toolkit of traffic calming techniques. Retrofits for the road so drivers have to slow down. We started with the idea of speed cushions. Rubber speed bumps that you mount onto the pavement. 
the only way for a speeding driver not to be chucked around in his seat is for them to slow way down. At least, theoretically. Wow. But we can't put them on these, these roads here, only neighborhood streets. Because fire trucks, trash trucks, and school buses use these medium-sized collector streets. And nobody wants to be riding in an ambulance that keeps Ow. going over bumps. So, not those. The engineers we have working with us are pulling ideas all over, and we finally came to a design that we thought fit. The engineers settled on this and a hybrid of these two ideas. Then we tested out some of the traffic calming circles, because these aren't roundabouts, these are traffic calming circles. A round, circular island, so anybody charging straight down the street has to slow down to be able to safely drive around it. And, because it's at an intersection, you get to calm two streets for the price of one. We're still working on the issue of people doing the drifting or donuts in the centers. <laughs> We're going to put some obstacles in the way so they can't even do that. And of course, the piece de resistance. Piece de resistance. Now, whatever. The zigzagging. A combination of a lateral shift where a roadway lane moves over and a racetrack feature called a chicane. Anybody can mindlessly zoom down a straight line, but add a little back and forth and you have to start to think. Slow down a little bit. The first roadway chicane I can find goes clear back to the 1940s. The British Isles thankfully were never invaded by the Nazis, but just in case the British Army would chop down trees along the major highways and lay them out like this. That way the advancing German Army couldn't just keep cruising down the highway They'd have to slow down and serpentine around the fallen trees. And that right there would be when the British Army would ambush them. Slowing you down horizontally. It's keeping you focused that something's changing. Even in this highly imperfect form, it seems to be working. Drivers are slowing down. It did its job. That guy was only going 25. If we can get 80% of the people to start slowing down, we're winning. In the coming weeks, the contractor will come back and fix this street the right way. So if your city faces the same problem, should it give this remedy a try? Different cities can look at it and we'll give them the data of if it worked or if it didn't work. We're learning from others, they're learning from us. But make sure it's not zigzagged. <laughs>